Hi, this is Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that I know touches home to lots of classrooms and lots of teachers, and that is copyright. And I know from images that students use to videos that student that teachers play, and all sorts of things in between, there there are lots of things that we need to know, and sometimes it's not super easy to find the answers. But thankfully, today. I have found somebody that has all the answers. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to see what kind of reaction I get. That's a big promise. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, but, but you, you've got some information that could be useful to us. Christina, why don't you tell us who you are and, and what you do real quick? Yeah, hi, I'm Christina Peters. I am the Digital Learning Specialist at the Nebraska Department of Education. So I do a lot of um, technology integration work, um, counsel as far as, you know, one-to-one deployment or whatever, a lot of professional development, and um, I particularly work with our school librarians, and so this has become a very hot topic here in the state of Nebraska because of some instances, um, but I've also learned so much from school librarians just within the past year about how we can continue to spread this message for teachers, um, administrators, and even our students. Awesome. Very good. Okay, so speaking of them, of the, the students and teachers and everyone, um, what are some uh, some ways that we're either using copyrighted content or maybe abusing copyrighted content in the classroom that either we, we probably realize we're doing it and we shouldn't, or maybe we don't even realize that we're doing it at all. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually going to flip over to um, some slides that I have that I would love to be able to share with you all. Um, yeah. Just because um, I'm going to, it helps trigger my memory too and that I can walk you through some of these. Um, where we see these most commonly is when we go to grab a quick image, we go straight to Google Images, um, do a quick search and say, all right, that one looks great. Um, but really, if we start to look at some of these, these were the first three rows that came back as far as images, specifically whenever I search for students. Um, some of the ways that I can tell that these are gonna be copyrighted right away and I can't just copy and paste it or drag and drop it and use it necessarily, is that they're stock photos. You can tell by um, right. the white backgrounds, it's very staged. I mean, I know that my students didn't come into my classroom with their notebooks ready to go like this. Um, just like if I did a script <laughs> for teachers and I see the, the woman in the front of the classroom with her pearls in front of the chalkboard. Um, <laughs> these are all kind of signs that are like, oh, okay, those are gonna be stock photos. And most often those, are, uh, those require payment to be able to use those. Um, you might also see a watermark, which is that kind of shadow um, wording that will be anywhere on the photo. It may not be on the photo, but it may say something um, below it too where it says copyrighted. So it kind of just varies. So we see a lot of image use. Um, we see a lot of video use in the terms of YouTube videos specifically. So downloading a YouTube video, uh, not that anyone really wants to go in and read the terms of service on YouTube necessarily, but if you look at the terms of service, if you download a YouTube video, it technically violates those terms of services. Um, so if you are going and doing a quick search and you say download YouTube video, there is a long Google search that will come back and um, give you a ton of different tools or, or websites that will allow you to download it. Technically, that violates their terms of services. So while it's nice to have that as plan B, uh, in some cases where you may not know if you have YouTube blocked at a school district or even um, that you have like spotty internet sometimes, it's nice to have that as plan B. But just know that technically, if it's sitting on your machine, that could be a violation. Um, go ahead. Do you happen to know if... I mean, if, <laughs> if we're going to be real here and teachers are looking at this and they're I going, know. am I really going to do, do you know what, what could happen if you're, if you're like caught in violation of their terms of service? If you don't know this off the top of your head, that's okay. I'm just yeah. Kidding. So I, I don't know specifically. I do know um, on this side, when you're uploading content, what can happen mm -hmm. uh, if it's copyrighted content that you've uploaded. Now, I don't know about the downloading necessary. Right. Thoroughly. Um, I do know that YouTube functions on a three strike rule. Um, they will send you three warning emails saying that you have either copyrighted content, um, specifically, mm -hmm. again, uh, talking about uploading. Uh, and then once they have given you your three strikes, they will delete your account completely. Uh, and that obviously your YouTube account is tied to your Gmail account now and it does not matter if it's in a Google Apps for Education domain, it will all be deleted. Wow, okay. Uh, 
I know this because I had a seventh grade student actually tell me this happened to him. <laughs> a seventh grade student. Wow. A seventh grade student. He had uploaded um, three different video. Well, more than that, but he had gotten his three strike, um, his third strike and the whole entire account was deleted. He was, or is a gamer and was um, having mm. it record over his shoulder and it was all obviously copyrighted content. Um, it wasn't transformative in any way. And so it was just showing the copyrighted content mm -hmm. and he was uploading that. And so it was, it was flagged and unfortunately it was taken down, uh, huh. which is, it's, it's scary when you think about that sometimes, but we know that we want kids to be creating and, and putting things out there, but we right. also have to have that conversation. If you're not changing things, if you're not adding any sort of value to something on a screen, then um, that would be considered copyrighted and not, not necessarily a fair use. So, right, right. Can I, yeah. I'll, I'll throw yeah, my, yeah. my one little experience with that in mm -hmm. too. I, I made a video not too long ago on my YouTube channel that was, it was just a bunch of sketches that I had made on my iPad that I put together as a video. And what I found out through that is that once you upload something to YouTube, it basically scans that video and is yep. like, it's looking for a couple of different things. And one of them is copyrighted material. And one of them, which I found out, this is, this is so weird, um, is that it's looking for offensive or like obscene material. And really? I don't know what it was in my video, but somehow, and let me say that that video A is still on my YouTube channel. B has nothing obscene in it. But for some reason, it saw it as obscene content and it gave me really? my first strike. And there was nothing obscene in it. And so I was allowed to appeal it. Yeah. So I sent an appeal in within less than a day, apparently, because I, I was reading and apparently no real human eyes actually look at it until there's been a strike put on it and you put yep. an appeal. And so. Interesting. Put, yeah. Yeah. And so I put my appeal through and in less than a day, somebody looked at it and the strike was taken off and my video was put up and everything was, was above board at that point. But Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that that totally shocked me. <laughs> I'm thinking, there's nothing wrong with this video. <laughs> there's nothing. I promise. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, like, please, somebody you know, look at this. So. You know, I I have an an instance myself. So I'm a singer, and for the fun of it, a couple years ago, I was like, I'm just gonna start putting videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I downloaded um, a karaoke track, and then I would sing to that because I don't play any instruments or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got an email notification about that because it was copyrighted music that was being played in the background. Uh, and when I did things that were acapella and had no music to them, I didn't get any sort of notification. Okay. So it's really, um, it's Google's, it's one of their algorithms that are scanning yeah. every video that's uploaded. So that's interesting to hear that they haven't had any human eyes on it. It's that algorithm that's doing that and scanning the content, and then they have the human eyes that will look afterwards. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So hmm. I guess the 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 takeaway lesson for this particular topic <laughs> on that is that that YouTube is looking immediately, even mm -hmm. if it isn't with human eyes. It's through this algorithm. It's through this this scan of the videos that get get uploaded. So if you've got copyrighted stuff on there, they catch it a lot of times. Exactly. And it's right away too. So. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, one other thing that we really see as far as um, technically violating copyright is showing movies in classes. Um, so indoor recess, um, classroom like rewards for behavior, like we got so many marbles in the jar kind of thing, or even on a Friday afternoon where I don't feel like teaching. Um, if no, I that doesn't happen. <laughs> what are you talking about? Gosh, I wish that were true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I, I'm, I'm completely guilty of this. I taught elementary, lower elementary, um, towards the end of the school year, you know, I would stop at Redbox on the way. I had no idea that I could not do that legally. Um, and you may be thinking, oh my gosh, it's in my classroom. No one's going to know. No one's going to care. Actually, they do know and they do care. So, um, but here's a scenario. I may not be really happy with you as a colleague of mine. And if I walk by your um, your classroom, and I see that you're showing a Disney movie, for example, really, really specific. Um, there is a whistleblower hotline that Disney has that I can call and I can say, this person here at this school is watching a Disney movie in their classroom and they don't have rights to do that. And Disney can reward a whistleblower $10,000 for calling in for that kind of a copyright violation. 
And that is an insane amount of money for one. And two, again, you may not think it could happen, but it really can. Um, we've also had some, some administrators contacting us about purchasing Netflix accounts for the purposes of classrooms. And we're like, no, 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 no. That violates their terms of service as well because it's intended for personal use. Anytime that I'm showing a movie in front of a large group of people, large being anywhere from like five or more, really, mm -hmm. it's considered a public performance and you have to have the rights to do that. Now that is for showing it for entertainment purposes. It's one thing if I am showing um, like the 1968 Romeo and Juliet to compare that to the 1996 Romeo and Juliet okay. and I want to be able to compare and contrast those two versus the play that we've read in class. If I'm mm -hmm. tying it back into my curriculum and my standards, that would be an appropriate and fair use. For me to simply pop in Frozen on a Friday afternoon because I'm done for the week is not an appropriate use and wouldn't be fair use either. Gotcha. That makes gotcha. sense? Yes, that makes makes perfect sense. Okay. okay. So does that sort of, sorry, does that sort of wrap up that, that section or are there any other places where sometimes we're, we're, we might be violating copyright where we don't realize? Yeah, so um, music is also one that we have to think oh, about. Um, of course. Music is, uh, you may think, well, I bought it, I own it, right? Um, but if I am using that in a movie or an end of the year slideshow or whatever the case may be, um, I have to have permission in order to use that. Otherwise, I can use 30 second chunks, like you see a lot of dance or cheer teams do where they do a mashup of songs. Mm -hmm. um, that's because they don't have to get permission in order to do that. So that would be a legal use. Um, okay. My last two big ones that I really want to make teachers aware of are Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers. Uh, there is a lot of copyrighted content on both of these. Um, Pinterest is really, it's a curation tool. It's a place to gather and aggregate different resources. So if I, it's not a source itself. If I were writing a work cited or a bibliography, I would not type Pinterest as my source. Much like Wikipedia is not a source in and of itself. That's pulling things from different places too. Kind of the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And if, um, you know, a lot of a lot of teachers like really want to stay away from Wikipedia. It's a great starting place, much sure like is. Pinterest. It's a great place to get ideas. Um, for Wikipedia purposes, if I can prove it in two to three other locations, as far as the facts that I find, awesome. Mm -hmm. Pinterest, if I can find that in some other places, awesome. Again, it's just it's not a source, and I wouldn't be able to claim it as that. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers pay teachers. That's another big one as far as there's a lot of copyrighted content on there. So I may have my really cute um, reproducible here um, that I have taken from my district curriculum and I've changed it because I've changed the font and added some cute little clip art to it. And then I put it up here on teachers pay teachers and I either buy it or I'm actually selling it myself. Um, be really careful about that because they don't check for that. And if you've done that, um, you're in violation of copyright, especially if you are charging people for it. But even if you're not charging for it, it's a violation because that's all copyrighted materials. We have some school districts here in Nebraska that are actually as a curriculum team or at the district level, they're going on to teachers pay teachers once a week and they're checking for the curriculum that they have purchased and their specific school district employees and looking for stuff that's on there. It can violate your teaching contract and can lead to termination. So it's pretty serious wow. about that too. Now, as far as, as that goes, if you're creating, because there, there's got to be a way that you can do this ethically and legally. I assume if you're creating these things on your own time in your own house, that kind of thing, that probably that probably helps some of that, right? Absolutely, yeah. And and on your own devices. So if it's mm -hmm. a school issued device, then it belongs to the district. So if you are trying to do that, and awesome if you are in your creation and and you are creative and you want to make that available and put it out there, just make sure that those are very, very distinct lines that you have between those two. Okay. And I want to ask you something else about this. And again, yeah. like any of my other follow-up questions, if, if, you're, if you're not exactly sure, that's, that's totally fine. But um, I know 
See, when, when I was in a, in a former life, I was a newspaper reporter. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of times newspaper reporters will go off and write their own book based on the things that they experienced, the things that they mm. saw while they were working for the newspaper. Right. Now, if they sat down at their newspaper desk with their computer owned by the newspaper and they wrote a book on newspaper time, then that's one thing. Right. But based on the experiences and the knowledge and the ideas that they have up here, they will go home on their own time, on their own devices and all of that. And with those ideas, they will create something of their own and then market that. And so that's, that's always been kind of a, a blurry yep. line for me as far as the ideas that I use to teach in class. Mm -hmm. I come home and there are similar ideas that I want to market. It's like, where's kind of like, where's the, the line? Do you have any suggestions for how we can, we can do that? carefully yeah i mean really it it does come down to using your own um devices as far as if you are creating anything mm -hmm. um, um obviously not providing any sort of identifying information for students or anything like that that would be yeah. or school district even so not you know not your school name or not your district information um keeping yeah. those things very separate um, but you are going to pull from the experiences that you have in your classroom. It's just, it's a given. So yeah. um, it's one thing if you're doing, I mean, the easiest thing for me to, to think of like is a worksheet. Uh, I don't like worksheets, but uh, <laughs> if you were trying to create something like that and you were trying to use like um, different math equations or something like that, you can create your own math equations without having to look in your um, purchase curriculum for the district and, and copying that word for word. Sure. Um, where we see a lot of um, blurriness is when it is more English language arts based um, mm -hmm. or even more content specific like science or social studies. Um, if it's in the public domain, so social studies, a lot of primary sources and primary documents, mm -hmm. I can pull from that. But if I'm pulling directly from those, those purchase curricula, I really have to be careful because that's all copyrighted content. Yeah. Okay. But if you're creating your own stuff, mm -hmm. then you're, you're probably a lot safer that way as long as it doesn't have, like you said, those identifying things. Mm -hmm. Or if you can't go back in that curriculum and say, wait a second, this is word for word on this page. Right. As long as we're, we're away from that, then because the thing that I've heard with copyright a lot of times is that you can't copyright an idea. Mm -hmm. And there, there's material that you can, but as far as an idea, and so if we're talking about ways to present or ways to teach um, literature, that's not something that's copyrightable, but the materials, those, those are. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and some people may say like even strategies are technically considered copyrighted. I mean, the name of it might be like fan sure. and tech or whatever that may be. The yeah. strategy may be sure. copyrighted but implementing the strategy is not copyrighted. So right. you don't have to worry about that. Very good. Okay, thank you for, for clearing that up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Chrissy Van Osdale is an educator down in Houston, Texas, and um, she is a wonderful graphic designer and yeah. has some really great things to use in the classroom um, that you can actually print legally and not have to worry about copyright. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also really great conversation starters with students. So some of her posters I have on here just because I think that it's really good that you can challenge students and even educators. But if you think about it, that everything online, someone somewhere created. And so if if we're copying it, if we're right click, save as, screenshot, whatever else, and we're using it, we're stealing in some way. And so what is that teaching our kids whenever we do that? Mm -hmm. for, for a teacher to assign some sort of project where they say, go out and get some images and do this, and I don't care about copyright, what does that teach our students? Right. Um, so we have to really think about that everything and, and every time. Here's a perfect example. So she actually created this several years ago. I teach What's Your Superpower. I don't know if you've seen this before, but I love this. Mm -hmm. And in my last district, we actually had this printed on hooded sweatshirts that we could wear for Spirit Fridays. I had no idea that Chrissy actually created this. She uh, was the originator of that, really. She was the originator and wow. had the light bulb. And, and I'm sure that there are other people that had that saying, but to actually put it in this whole graphic and this representation here. Mm -hmm. um, so then people have shared with her other instances like this where 
they've removed her watermark, they've shared an altered version where they put the name of the school that they teach at, and then they have not given her any sort of credit or attribution. So again, that's illegal. What are we teaching kids? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, same thing happened here with this poster that's hers up in the corner. I facilitate thinking, I engage minds, I teach. All of these other instances that are on this page are all copyright violations. Um, this canvas right here was being sold on Etsy. This t-shirt was actually being sold on Amazon and it took a, an actual call to Amazon to say, that's mine, please take it down. Um, so we know that it happens and it's just being able to be aware of it really where, it, where we have to start. Um, sure. Sure. Here's, here's another poster. It's super snarky, which is why I like it. It's really good to use with students. Um, don't just copy, do the right thing. If I take off a watermark, do I own it? Well, is it okay to scratch someone's name off their homework and claim it? Uh, no. Okay. So <laughs> right. uh, ask those, those questions that you're just like, no, you know the answer to that and you wouldn't want that to happen to you. So don't do it to other people. Um, copyright, you're all kind of familiar with the big C. It means all rights reserved. You have to have explicit permission in order to use it. Um, that is print and digital. That is the big thing with the ever increasing use of technology in the schools. People think, oh, it's digital, it's online, I found it on Google, it's available, I can use it, not a big deal. And that is not true necessarily. So we have to really um, look at all types of instructional materials, whether they're print or digital, and that we have to have permission in order to use those. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the legalities and the implications of that are um, if it were ever to go to court, as far as um, copyright violations or anything like that, fines can range $250 to $150,000. And then if the judge determines that it was done willfully, knowing that it was copyrighted and it was used anyway, there is a potential of one year in prison as well. Wow. Um, so pretty severe, pretty harsh. We know that the law has not necessarily caught up with our use of technology and, and use of these materials in the classroom, but um, a lot of people are like, nope, can't happen, can't happen. Um, it can. And it's all because of things like this. Um, so this is images.google.com. I went directly to Google Images. Uh, there is such thing as a reverse image search. And um, there are a lot of trolls out there on the internet, not the ones that leave really nasty YouTube comments or... Um, <laughs> There's lots of them too, though. There, there are lots of them. <laughs> um, but big companies are actually paying folks over, um, overseas to go out and troll the internet for copyrighted content. And all they have to do is do a reverse image search. So they would take an image that they had already they drag it right in here into the, the search bar itself, and it will pull up any website where that, that image sits on. Um, and so you can do it with copyrighted material, you can do it with Creative Commons materials, and you can even see where different websites have that content available. So mm -hmm. we know that it's happening. Um, when that happens, we also get cease and desist letters. Um, and right here in our own state of Nebraska, we've had this happen several times over the past um, year at this point. We've had two school districts that have received cease and desist letters for copyrighted images that were sitting on their website or a teacher blog. And they also received fines, and those range from $200 to $3,000. Yikes. Um, yeah, so we also had an educational service unit, which is kind of an area that helps different districts in that area. Um, they had a national presenter come in, used her slides, got permission to put her slides on their website. Well, the slides had a copyrighted image in there. They received a cease and desist letter because they were the ones that had the slides sitting on their website and mm -hmm. they were held liable for it at that point. They negotiated the fine down to $700. So we know that it's happening um, more and more because of those lovely trolls that go out there and look online and can do a quick Google image, um, like that reverse search. Yeah, gosh, and that's, that's, obviously scary, especially, yeah. and I'm glad that you, you put out the, the specific numbers on some of those fines. And I think a lot of times, like you said, as teachers and as uh, educators, just in general, we think, oh, well, nobody's really going to be looking at my mm -hmm. stuff. But then when you see like, boom, here's a specific place in Nebraska where right. they had to pay $3,000. I mean, that, that really brings it home. And so yeah. that kind of, that kind of brings this question to mind for me at yeah. least is, um, 
So if all of this copyrighted material is out there, um, how can I avoid using that? Because I know sometimes when I was very first getting into this, I had a couple of sources of good content, but I would look through it and I'd go, this stuff isn't that great. This mm -hmm. isn't really, and I knew that there was a lot more out there that I probably could use, and I didn't really want to pay for stock photos because I'm cheap. Mm, you know, I understand. <laughs> which, which you can do. I know some people do yeah. pay for, for stock photos, and that's, and that's a good, good way to go. But um, are there some ways that we can use some of this media images or music or videos or whatever, um, is there, are there ways that we can use it so that we're being ethical and we're not going to receive those fines? Yeah, yeah. Um, so really when we started to look at copyright, we have to also consider fair use, which a lot of people are like, oh, I don't understand fair use. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to walk you through those four steps, but I also want to give you a very specific resource that you can use, and that is Creative Commons. Yes. Um, Creativecommons.org. I will direct people there any day, every day, yeah. um, to find all of that media that you just mentioned. So um, if you're looking for images, if you're looking for music, if you're looking for videos, that's where you would want to go to begin that search. They have a wide variety of their databases that all kind of pull together. You can search one at a time. And I'm happy to provide some more, some more info on that too. Okay. Um, when you think about the, the fair use here, you have to consider these four factors. Now, um, when we're, I'm sorry, yeah. when we're getting yeah. into fair use, so yeah. what we talked about before with Creative Commons was these are like, this is a resource where we can get some stuff that we can use. Yes. And then fair use, this is going to be kind of like the other side of that where it's like, okay, this is copyrighted material and there are certain times when we can use this. So those are yes. kind of like, that's kind of like the dichotomy between those two, right? It is. Yes, and thank yeah. you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Okay, um, go ahead. Really, so copyrighted, so for, um, fair use goes in conjunction with copyright. So it's mm. part of the Copyright Act. It's the fair use. Um, so it's these four factors that you have to really consider. One right. is the, the, the purpose and use of whatever this copyright material is. So it also, um, it's also has to look at the transformative factor. That's whenever I was talking about earlier. Like, did it add value to that that young boy playing his games. So what's the purpose and the character of the use? So um, is it for educational purposes? Most often we're gonna be able to say it's for educational purposes, therefore it's gonna be okay and we can claim fair use. Um, parody, if it is making fun of something, Weird Al Yankovic has made his entire career off of right. Um, news reporting and research. Those are like the four main purposes and uses of copyrighted material. If you can look at those for those four purposes and say, it's for educational purposes, I'm going to be okay to use this. You also have to consider the transformative factor of using that copyrighted material. So I had mentioned earlier, like I'm a singer. So if I sang an Adele song straight, just exactly as she does, um, I have not added any value to that. I'm singing it. It's a cover. I might be lip syncing to it, whatever it may be. But then let's say Adele's newer song, Hello, that came out um, the end of last year, there was a viral video that came out in like January where it I love was, this video. Well, are you thinking of the same one? I don't, I don't know. know. This is the snow day one is what I'm thinking of. Okay. So there's the snow day one, which is a parody. Yeah. Um, they've rewritten the lyrics and uh -huh. that would be considered transformative. They've added value. They've changed the, the meaning of the original version. Mm -hmm. um, you even have something as simple as the one that was like the young girl with the reggae artist. They changed the actual rhythm and the tempo of the song and they added value to it. So that would be considered mm -hmm. fair use and not necessarily a copyright violation. So that's number one. Number two is um, the amount used. You know, is it a, a small bite-sized chunk? Again, if I think about music purposes, 30-second um, clips, a mashup of songs. Uh, mm -hmm. I might show, if I'm showing a video, um, back to that Romeo and Juliet example, if I can show the balcony scene, if I'm really just focusing on those two things or that thing in particular and show those in the video and compare that to the play, I would mm -hmm. be better off rather than showing the entire full length feature film just because I don't need it for the purposes of, of teaching that. Um, then you have to consider, is it uh, fiction or is it factual? It's a lot easier to claim fair use on facts because you can find those facts in many places. 
if it's fiction, it's creative. And I can't just come out and say that I was the one that actually wrote Harry Potter and not JK Rowling. Um, (laughs) It's just harder to claim fair use on that. And the last one is the effect on the market for the work. So basically what it comes down to, if you're going to take away potential profits from the copyright holder, they're going to have a lot more problems with you saying, Oh, that was fair use. Go ahead. You know, go ahead, go ahead and use my copyrighted material, especially if you're going to profit off of it in any way. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just harder to claim that. So what we see most often with especially elementary teachers, they like to record themselves reading books and then provide some sort of audio book for for their students to be able to listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, That is great in your classroom, in your classroom. It can't go out any further than that. So if it's put on your blog or on your um, teacher website or whatever, even on your district website, um, that's when you start to run into issues because most often you're going to be able to go on Amazon and find the audiobook version of Where the Wild Things Are. Oh, okay. And you gotcha. would be taking away the profit or potential profit from that copyright holder. So in your classroom, fine. We're putting it out there anywhere online. That's when we start to run into issues. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. (laughs) Number four, I heard a presentation by Ginger Lumen about, um, about copyright. And I, I remember the way that she, she summed up number four was number four was the, it was something like the, um, the food out of the mouths of babes rule or something (laughs) like that. (laughs) Like, nice. <laughs> taking food off of the plate of your, and exactly. obviously the, the creatives that you're probably taking from probably are not struggling to get food on the table for their yeah, kids, but you know. it's, the, it's the same sort of idea. So, yeah. So yeah, I love that. That's great. Okay. So what you're saying here is we can, we, these are, these are kind of like the four tests to see whether you can use copyright and how much you can use it. And so yep. as far as copyrighted material, there are times when you can use it. Yep. And I heard, now correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I've heard that whenever we do use copyrighted material, it's almost like if you think about it ahead of time, you want to like kind of make your legal defense mm-hmm. as you're, before you use it. So if you say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and use it and I'm going to claim, if somebody were to sue me, I'm going to claim fair use because I used just this much of it and that was all that I needed yep. and it's because it was for educational purposes and because it's fact. Yep. You're, you know, if you, it's like the more of those four that you can put together, the better your, your case is. Absolutely. And there have not been a lot of copyright cases as far as K-12 education goes. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had none here in Nebraska. We have had the cease and desist letters and things like that. So you would want to have that argument ready for you. And, and I have a lot of teachers that are like, oh, I'm done. Like, I'm just not going to do anything. And I don't yeah. want, I don't want uh, teachers to, to get into that mentality or say, you know what, I, it's not worth my time and effort. Right. Four little things you have to walk through and yeah. it's on a case by case basis. Mm-hmm. And it's for us to help get between those gray areas where we're like, you know, I think I could use this because it is for educational purposes mm-hmm. and I'm using this with my students and it's in, I'm using it in the right ways. Um, yeah. I, again, I can't throw in a movie and say, great, I'm done teaching for the week. So <laughs> right. that you know, there are differences and we know that, but it's, it's making ourselves aware of this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's perfect. All right. So that's, so as far as copyrighted content, there are ways that we can use it ethically and legally under fair use. And so as far as creative commons goes, it goes, it goes deeper than just saying, Oh, this is a creative commons image. So I can do whatever I want with it. Right. That is correct. So I'm going to jump back over here to my slides just so I have um, my reference. Mm -hmm. Um, Creative Commons works on these four basic licenses, and these can be combined in a variety of manners as well. Um, So if you, it's very icon driven. So the more you use these icons, you'll know what you can and cannot do with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Attribution is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of saying citations or citing something, when we're using multimedia specifically, we say we attribute it. So attribution, I can do a lot with it as long as I give credit back to the original author or creator. Non-commercial means I cannot profit off of it, but I could still use it. So if I'm going to use it on a billboard that would potentially lead to profit, that would not count. Um, If I were trying to sell it for something, I couldn't do that if I had a non-commercial license. 
But if I'm just using it in a slide deck or in a presentation that I'm not going to necessarily make any money off of, that would be appropriate. Uh, no, no derivatives, is that equal sign, basically means you cannot change it. So if it's a color photo and you decide you really want to change it to black and white, if it had that no derivatives um, icon or, or uh, license on it, I wouldn't be able to do that. Pretty, pretty uh, straightforward as far as just using it as it is. And changing from color to black and white, we would think, oh, that's not a, a huge material change, but yeah. that is, a, see, I would have never guessed that. I would have thought, okay, well, this is Creative Commons. It says, so for me, I'll, I'll give you an example for me on my yeah. blog here recently. I've been pulling, a lot of times are public domain images, which I know is sort of a whole different thing, but let's yeah. say... I pulled a Creative Commons image that said no derivative works, and then I throw it into my Word Swag app, which puts text on the top of that image, and then I even put my little um, ditch that textbook logo like as a watermark in the bottom right-hand corner. Right. That's technically a derivative because it's got that text on it, and it didn't before, right? Exactly. Yep, that is exactly. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. <laughs> You're like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like I said, I've got a couple places with public domain images, which is sort of a whole different ball game. And it is. on those, you can do derivative works, I think. But yeah, you know, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to cross over. You know, get into too many different content areas. I'll let you keep going on your creative sure. comments here. Sure. Um, share like is really kind of a pay it forward license. Um, so if I am using an image in a video that I'm creating and it has a share alike license, that means that my final product or my final video has to have a share alike license on it to pay it forward to that next person. Um, so again, these can kind of be combined in a variety of manners. Um, these are the least restrictive is that attributions license. There's just a lot that I can do up here down to the bottom, which is the most restrictive, which is attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. So you use it as it is. You attribute it back to the original creator. You cannot profit off of it. That's, it's still usable, but there are some more restrictions on it. Mm -hmm. um, Here's a kind of a checklist of what you can and cannot do too. So you had mentioned public domain and public domain is not copyrighted. And so here are the three to four different things that you can do with it. You can use it for commercial purposes. You can modify and adapt it. So, um, so long as it is in that public domain, then you could add that text on top of it and, and use it for those purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, public domain is basically um, anything with a .gov uh, internet sites, um, you can pretty much count on it being public domain. So you have your National Archives, your Library of Congress, the Smithsonian. There's a ton of stuff out there that already sits in the public domain. Um, as far as other content that actually used to be copyrighted, um, it is 70 years after the copyright owner or copyright holder has died. And that is all because of Walt Disney and Steamboat Willie. <laughs> right. I heard, of, I think you were telling me about that. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So um, it wasn't, it was even as recent as like 1998, I think is when they had the most recent change in that. And they pushed to have the copyright extended so that Mickey Mouse wouldn't go in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, that is soon going to expire in 2023. And so I think we're actually going to see some changes in copyright and public domain within the next couple of years because they really, really don't want Mickey to go public domain. So wow. that will be very interesting, um, you know, to nerds like me that find copyright interesting. But um, I think that'll be really interesting to follow along over the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, now, as far as the Creative Commons, I wanted to, Oh, you're about to talk about Creative Commons and Google. You may be, you may be heading where I was about to head. So you go ahead and go, and then I'll see if you just read my mind. Okay, so Creative Commons and Google are most often where you're going to find these resources. Now, there are certain places that I'm going to point you to that are not part of these two. But um, if I really think about um, scaffolding my approach with students, um, I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. If I'm scaffolding my approach to students, I want to do something thing that's going to be um, the least amount of effort and help provide them as much um, help and support along the way and then slowly start to wean them off so that they can do it themselves. And when we do it, the, when we do it ourselves and we look at attribution, we follow this acronym here. I promise I know how to spell tassel, but this is the acronym that we <laughs> use. 
okay. um, for title, author, source, and license. So there's no MLA, APA, Chicago style. Like there's nothing there for uh, attributing our multimedia use. We look at title, author, source, and license, and that's coming directly from Creative Commons. And it can go under the photo, just like a caption would, and be used in a blog post, in a paper, um, whatever the case may be. For the purposes of my slides here, I actually saved all of mine towards the very end so it doesn't clutter up all of my photos or my slides themselves. And mm -hmm. it just depends on how much you're going to be using and how you need to um, kind of show that work. So um, here's what Creative Commons looks like. Well, this is actually search.creativecommons.org. I want to make sure that you're aware of that. I love that specific page, that search one. That, yes. I, that's like a go-to for me. That's awesome. Absolutely. So if you just go to creativecommons.org, it's a nonprofit. They have a ton of information on there. You can license your own stuff. So if you're an amateur photographer or graphic designer or whatever else, and you want to be able to put a Creative Commons license on your content, you can certainly go there and learn more about how to do that. But if you are looking for things, go directly to search.creativecommons.org, bookmark it, save it for your references um, and your resources for later. You can see right here all the different places where you can go in and find images right away. So Flickr, Photopedia, Google Images, Open Clip Art Library, Wikimedia Commons, Pixabay, those are all just images. Then you have music, Jamendo, CC Mixer, and SoundCloud. And then you have video. With YouTube, um, Spin Express has videos on there as well, and Europeana has it as well. So it really depends on what you're looking for. You go up and enter your query up here, and then you, um, you select one of these at a time um, that you're going to search, and then it will pull up all Creative Commons licensed materials in that database specifically. Okay. So go ahead. Can I ask you a quick question about yeah, that? Yeah, um, I've noticed, especially going through, and first of all, the Google images that it shows on the screen that you're showing right here is different from the normal Google images because it, it only pulls from the stuff that's licensed as Creative Commons, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. It's, already, it's already got that filter on the search, yes. Yeah, so sometimes I think, especially for me at the beginning, I'm going, wait a second, Google images, I know there's lots of copyrighted stuff there, that's just that specific filtered search. And yeah. then the thing I wanted to ask you about was, I know sometimes when I go through these, especially when I look at Flickr and Google Images, those are like the two main ones that I look for yep. um, for Creative Commons. And sometimes I find what I think are probably copyrighted images that are labeled as Creative Commons, where I assume that the Flickr uh, account owner has uploaded an image that they don't have the right to use and they've flagged it as Creative Commons, but it's not actually. So I guess my question mm -hmm. is, do not do we probably want to be careful, kind of be judicious of what we find there? And if it seems too good to be true, maybe we shouldn't use it? Yes, I would be careful. Although it may have that Creative Commons license on it, we do have to be careful with the stuff that is posted because you will find a lot of stuff on there, whether it's um, like the inside of a book, well, that's copyrighted material. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, even the spines of books or pictures of specific kind of technology or whatever mm -hmm. else, it, that is technically all copyrighted content. Um, so we do have to kind of be careful about the stuff that, that we find on there. One note about Flickr too, Flickr is a community of people that contribute photos. Mm -hmm. So um, two, two things I want to make sure that you're aware of. It is all, the, the searching capability is all done through metadata or meta tagging, which are those keywords that get added to a photo. Whether you put those on there or whether it automatically generates the tags based on the photo itself, you can do both. Um, but there is potential for human error on there. So um, I put a lot of my photos on there with Creative Commons licenses, but if I don't tag them appropriately, then they're going to come up wrong in a search. Um, there's also the, the possibility of inappropriate or explicit material on Flickr from time to time. And you really want to make sure if you're doing this with students that they turn the safe search on on Flickr. Okay. Um, that will help filter out any sort of inappropriate photos um, if it happens, 
that's a great teachable moment to say, here's what we do. We don't freak out and have all of our friends come over and look at the inappropriate photo. <laughs> um, we close out of the tab. We close out of the window. We tell our teacher and we move on. But yeah. of course, that's going to be different for me in elementary versus high school. So, yeah. uh, but it, it's still how we, how we would handle that kind of situation. Um, and I'll be the first one to say that I have done that without a safe search on in front of students and teachers. Mm -hmm. And it, it's surprising some of the stuff that comes on there. So I was looking for something as simple as giraffes and I found giraffes mating, which is not necessarily something completely terrible. Uh -huh. It is human nature, but it's also not something I really wanted to show second graders. Right. So you just have to be careful whenever you do that. If you're doing a search live in front of students, just close your LCD projector for the moment, make sure that they're okay, and then open mm -hmm. that back up. Just good. on my own experience. <laughs> yes, yes. Very good. Very good. I like that. Well, I don't like the giraffes mating part, but I do like the tip. I think that's really good. Okay, fun. good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to run through a couple of these different tools for you, especially if you're getting started. Again, scaffolding, the work is done for you, and you can mm -hmm. lean off of that. Um, photos for class pulls directly from Flickr. They're safe. The automatic attribution is included, and they're all Creative Commons licensed. So you go to photosforclass.com, do a quick search in here. Uh, you can choose any of the photos that it brings back. So I did a quick search for students. I can select whichever photo I want to do. Once I download it, the attribution is added to the photo like a footer. Right. I don't have to do anything else. So I can pull this into a slide deck. I can pull this into my Word document or my Google Doc or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and it's already there for me. So I don't even have to do much of the work other than I have to go to the right place in order to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have an additional website called Photos for Work. So if you have mm -hmm. um, career and technical education students that are doing some programs of study at the high school level, um, this is a great site in order to find more real world work scenarios. So it's Photos for Work. Um, Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. I love Pixabay. Oh my gosh, I love Pixabay. Yeah. Um, high quality, high resolution images, vectors, um, illustrations. So you have graphic designers on here, you have photographers on here, and you do a quick search. Um, you can filter the search based on what you want. If you want illustrations as part of the search that it brings back, and mm -hmm. it'll bring back all of these different photos. The, I do want to warn you, the very first row is sponsored images. If you kind of pay attention right here, um, those are all from Shutterstock. And so if you actually click on those, it will take you to Shutterstock's website and you have to pay for that photo. Just pretend that whole first row isn't even there. And Even though see, those are the best photos a lot of times, I those know, are the ones that you have to pay for. I know, those are the ones, yeah. So keep scrolling down and you'll be able to find ones that help, um, that will meet your, your query. Um, you can go in and select different options as far as the size that you wanna download. And here's the best part is that Pixabay has a different license than any of the ones that we've kind of talked about. Their yeah. license is a combination between public domain and creative commons. And so all I have to say is image is CC0 public domain. I don't have to worry about anything else. No title, author, source, and license. All I have to say is CC0 public domain, which is pretty awesome to do. Um, the next one is Fodor.com, F-O-T-E-R.com. And they have just a few free stock photos to choose from. <laughs> 228 million. Just, I mean, you know, just that's not few. that much. But. No, no. Um, they, again, are pulling from Flickr. You can search by license type up here. Highly recommend having that safe search turned on. Again, it's pulling from Flickr, so you, you want to worry about that as well. Um, and then it even walks you through the steps. So step one, you look at the size of the image that you need. Step two, you can check for the license. And then if you keep scrolling down, step three has the attribution already done for you. So all I would do would be copy and paste that and drop that wherever I need it. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, back to creative or search.creativecommons.org, you have Flickr. You also have Wikimedia Commons. I have a few screenshots on here, and I'm happy to share the link with any of your readers or viewers um, okay. so that they can kind of see how you would do it. Basically, just screenshots of um, where you'll find the information for um, attribution purposes, how to download uh, mm -hmm. Wikimedia Commons. I did want to show on Google, uh, you had mentioned this earlier, so it's a little different if I went to Google versus through Creative Commons. Um, if you do just go straight to Google, which we know most often we do, and that's totally mm -hmm. fine. Uh, mm -hmm. 
do your search. And when you get your search back, click on search tools. And there's another toolbar that pops down below that. Then you can click on usage right and you can filter it by a Creative Commons license. So then that will strip down any of the results that it's already brought back and that'll be labeled for um, purposes that you can actually use. Mm -hmm. Very, very handy. Um, and that's one of my, my go-tos. Because like I said, we all start with Google anyway. Um, although Pixabay, like I said, one of my favorites. Um, yeah. But we all tend to start there anyway. So if we can get students to start there, if we can even get teachers to start there and start modeling that for students, it's a great way to, great way to get, get started. Yeah. Now, as far as Google goes, can I bring up another place where we can find Creative Commons images? And um, you here, sure I'm going to try. Well, gee, thanks. Um, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to try to share my screen here, okay. and so this will bring up. Do you see my document here? Yes, I do. Okay, these are my notes from our uh, from what you've said so far. And nice. uh, if you hit insert an image. Um, a lot of times it pulls this up right here and this goes for docs it goes for slides it goes for drawings I don't think it goes for sheets but you've got all of these places where you can take images and by the way if you take a snapshot which is right here using your if it's gonna pull up um, okay if you've got a, a webcam connected either on your computer or whatever and you take your own picture obviously if it's your own picture you have the rights to it and you don't yep. have to worry about it absolutely um, but the one that I found over here was search. And when I first saw that, I thought, well, this is just going to be another Google Images search and it's going to pull up a bunch of copyrighted <laughs> material. But if you read the fine print here, it says results shown are labeled for commercial reuse with modification. Perfect. And then if you click learn more, it tells you specifically what Creative Commons uh, license that is. And so basically, this is an easy way to pull these images into your documents or your slides or your drawings that are Creative Commons that you do have the right to use. And it's all integrated right there into Google Apps, which I love. I do too. That's yeah. awesome. So. So great. Yeah. And they, they have all of the life photos on there that are Creative Commons licensed, as far as I know, which are pretty cool too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is a really nice, uh, that's a really nice stockpile of pictures to be able to pull from. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing that I wanted to show just for, again, modeling purposes was, mm -hmm. let me do my share screen again, um, was my attributions for my slides here, how I had mentioned I didn't want to necessarily clutter up my slides. Oh, yeah. Um, this is how I attribute my slides. So I have a lot of different images. I've gone kind of above and beyond as far as typing in like screenshots by me, but I just wanted to be able to say these were my screenshots um, and this is how I would necessarily um, attribute that back to me or where I found all these things. So these are all hyperlinked. Um, they can take me back to the original um, posting and who the original creator or author is. Um, just a great way to be able to model that for students and um, yeah, and show them how easy it is to do. So um, yeah. And I wanted to ask you a quick question about that yeah. too. If you're doing a presentation in front of an audience or on a webinar or something, um, how do you incorporate that into your presentation? Do you just, as you're wrapping up at the end, do you just leave that on the screen for a little bit and then flip to the, the like this page right here? Or yeah. how do yeah. you do that? Yeah, so I, it, it really depends. I'm, I'm of the, the belief that you really should not have a lot of text on your slides. Um, just because the graphics are more, you know, compelling. So I will have that saved towards the end because I would rather have a photo be on my slide versus any sort of, you know, even small text, really. Right. Um, so, yes, I will leave this up and I can even say, you know, here are my attributions for my images. Um, whether or not you care doesn't really matter. But I want to be able to, sh to, show, to show you that I've legally, um, you know, obtained all of these or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen this more and more with presenters at conferences where they either, either have these saved to the end or have it somewhere noted on the photo itself, which makes my little heart happy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just because, you know, again, it's modeling for everyone um, the appropriate uses. And so I can always appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. Okay. All right. That's great. I, you know, honestly, that covers a lot of my questions that, that I had. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to touch on real fast here before we wrap up? I don't think so. I mean, a lot. Um, it is a lot. It is a lot. Um, I would say don't be scared. Um, also, oh, when you can create, create. Um, yeah. 
we all have these in our back pocket or mm -hmm. some sort of device with us at all times. Um, if you can't find the photos you want or you don't even have to want to worry about Creative Commons or copyright or anything like that, create it yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and give kids that option too. So if you need them to go find something, um, you know, whether it, it really doesn't even matter what it is, um, but have them create it and then you don't even have to worry about it. Yeah. I love that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Cause there's, there's nothing that said <laughs> the thing that I always come back to with these resources that are out on the internet is kind of like what you said earlier, somebody created those. Mm -hmm. And if everybody was a consumer and nobody was a creator, the internet wouldn't exist. Exactly. Because oh, it counts absolutely. on people creating things and there's nothing that says that we can't create too. Even if it's like you need a picture of a microphone and you just take this <laughs> microphone and you take a picture of it sitting on your desk, Yep, you've created your own picture and you don't have to mess with all of that. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's great. Okay, so um, Christina, if people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way if they're <gasps> interested? Yeah, through Twitter. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I'm always a tweet away. Um, yeah, Twitter is probably the easiest and I am at M-R-S-K-M Peters. Um, that's also my Gmail. So if you guys want to send me an email or whatever else, um, I'm always accessible and happy to answer your copyright questions, those mm -hmm. burning copyright questions. Wonderful. That's great. Do you have people call you Mrs. K.M. Peters in real life? Sure do. I love yeah. it. <laughs> Isn't that funny how our Twitter handles become like our, our alternate identities? Like people call me J. Matt Miller on a fairly regular basis. And <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever referred to my first initial except for like my mom until I got on Twitter. <laughs> so, isn't that great? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, it, it so. is. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, hey, thanks again so much for for coming on here and yeah. and giving us all this information. Thanks for having me.